Thank you once again. Welcome back to the Christian Symposium on Aliens. Our next speaker, one of my favorite guys in the field, is Bill Honor. Uh, his website will be williamhonor.com, A-L-N-O-R. He's got an older one that is cultlink.com, but he's moving stuff over to include a, much more of his new stuff. And when I first uh, got into this field, I remember I wanted to know if I was crazy or a lunatic or or what you know and his is one book I saw in a bookstore I picked it up read like three pages and just thanked God that I was on the right track and I hadn't totally lost it and so he was he doesn't know it but he was probably one of if not the major encouragement to me even beginning my ministry to, uh, 15 years ago almost so it's with a very affectionate heart and a lot of appreciation for him taking the time and making the trip to be here Please welcome up Bill Owner. Thank you, Guy. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. I was here about three or four years ago and had a really good time. Uh, I'm from, uh, I, I'm a professor at California State University East Bay, which is between Oakland and San Jose. So you're familiar with that? I see a hand going up. So yeah, so uh, I'm enjoying, this is my fourth year teaching there. I haven't really done a lot on UFOs really in the past four or five years. It's because I've been so involved with academics, you know, finishing my dissertation in 2004, which was about plagiarism in, religious, in the religious media. So I've done an awful lot of work in other fields as well, but I've written two of my four books on UFOs, and so it's a field that it continues to grow. And so last year when Guy asked me to come and speak, I said, with pleasure, you know. And so, uh, you know, I, I arrived in uh, just a, a couple hours ago. And so, but, um, and I'm like Mike. I've been a fan of Mike Heiser's for a long time as well. I'm not really, I'm kind of eclectic with a lot of the way I believe about things, but I believe that the Bible is God's word. I believe it's inerrant. And so I come at things from a very evangelical point of view. Now, my the title of my talk, and when Guy asked me to speak, we were jumping around different ideas of what I can speak upon, and uh, we decided on this topic, uh, Aliens and Demonology, a study through history and scripture, because a lot of my books talks about this interplay of, of demonology with fallen angels along with, the, with UFOs and what we have today. Uh, let me see... Okay, there we go. It's a provocative title for sure. I hope you can hear me all right. You know, I have the kind of the microphone to the side here. I'll try to pull it a little closer. Okay, good. Um, anyway, to some believers, there's a demon behind every rock. Have, has anyone ever met anyone like that, that everyone, is, it's the devil for everything? I don't necessarily believe that because I think that, you know, uh, there's all kinds of nuances. And, and I think that there is the realm of, 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 of God and there's also the realm of Satan. But I think that's extreme behavior when people sometimes just blame the devil for everything. Sometimes it's our own stupidity, our own mistakes that we made instead of some, something being devilish in, in in and, of, uh, in and of itself. But the opposite extreme is often worse and can be dangerous. Today, many people don't believe in demons at all. And as we'll see later on in my talk, some think that demons are good. I mean, that's just, we're in so much of a post-Christian era today that a lot of people attribute things of de that are really demonic into things that are really good. Now, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, we had a faculty meeting at Cal State East Bay, and uh, we were talking about if different accomplishments. And I mentioned I was coming here to speak at this conference. And I really don't talk a lot about UFOs in my classroom. I did get a question yesterday. I'm teaching, you know, I'm teaching a course over the summer, which I don't do very often. And and someone, you know, found out. You know, a couple of my books are up there displayed in the faculty behind the glass. And someone is saying in the middle of my communication theory class, well, "What do you really believe?" about UFOs and I said well give me the whole semester and I'll divert the whole class into talking about aliens instead of what we're supposed to be talking about but you know uh, but uh, uh, anyway so, so I talked about just I really didn't answer her question other than to say I think that they're real but it depends upon what you meet what your meaning of reality is and so so we could talk more about that a little bit later and then at the faculty meeting another professor said what you're speaking at Roswell what do you think of these aliens anyway and I said well I think a lot of them are demonic and he kind of laughed at me in front of the other faculty members you know and the other faculty members didn't know what to make of it and I said well what do you need to do is read my books and you'll know that I have very good reasons for believing that most UFO phenomena can be attributed to, to demons in the realm of fallen angels. And so uh, a lot of people, you mentioned demons, and they just don't take it seriously. First of all, 
and I have a lot of slides here. I will try to keep my time really, you know, uh, reined in. Uh, but first of all, what do the scriptures, what do the scriptures say about demons? First of all, Jesus talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. And he referred to demons on various occasions. As a matter of fact, on many occasions. He cast demons out of many people during his two and a half, one year ministry. And he stated that we can be influenced by demons and directly by Satan himself. And we can. And I think we all know, if we're honest with ourselves, we know when we're being influenced by the evil one. In Matthew 5, 37, Jesus forbade oaths and he said, let your yes be yes, a lot of you are familiar with the scripture passage, and your no be no, for whatever more than these is from the evil one. So I think we all, if we're mature Christians, we all know when we're being influenced by the forces of evil or Satan himself. And this is directly tied in to the realm of demons. Now, I want to give us a summary of some of my work in this topic, and I was uh, impressed to see some people selling my book out there, and that's really good. You know, Mike, I'm thankful for Mike for displaying my last book on UFOs, UFO Cults in the New Millennium. But I'm considered one of the Christian pioneers in this particular topic, even though I haven't written a lot about it in recent years. I do keep up with it. You know, I'm kind of, I'll get into this a little bit later, but I'm, I'm an apologist. I really deal with attacks upon the Christian faith. That's kind of the main thing that I do. I've been a figure in this field of apologetics for a long time. But my first book on UFOs was really, uh, there really wasn't, and I'm not bragging about this really, you know, but there really wasn't much out there when I first started looking into this topic. And my first book was called UFOs in the New Age, Extraterrestrial Messages and the Truth of Scripture, put out by Baker Bookhouse, which is a major evangelical publisher, in 1992. So we're going back in some time, but what led to this particular book is I was writing a magazine article for a Christian magazine, and, it was, and I went to a New Age conference because I was studying the New Age movement in New York City, and I, uh, and, and I was kind of a, a bit taken, taken aback, and it was about 1990 when about 30% of all the speakers at this New Age conference were talking about aliens and UFOs. And this is in the heyday of Shirley MacLaine and other things that she was talking about out on the limb. And if you followed that miniseries and followed her work, it all led into Peru. And one of the last scenes in her book, Out on the Limb, was like a flying saucer coming over the sky, you know, to kind of reveal new truths to her. So she, along with a number of others, Whitley Strieber is another one that wrote Communion, Transformation, and there are a number of books about UFOs over the years. And there's a lot of UFO writers that I've become familiar with over time. So I took this magazine article, and, and uh, I really was intrigued by it, and Baker Bookhouse contacted me and wanted to know if I wanted to do something more significant on the UFO topic. So I spent several years traveling more than 20,000 miles, going coast to coast, going all of the UFO conventions and talking directly to the UFO leaders. I really didn't want to read much Christian material on this stuff at that particular point because I wanted to make up my own mind of what, what the phenomena was all about. And so that book came out in 1992 and it really made an impact. I'm really thankful for the impact that it had and I'm thankful that, that Guy said some really nice things about it. And then my next book was UFO Cults in the New Millennium also by Baker Bookhouse in 1998 on this particular topic. Uh, my two other books, uh, UFOs, uh, uh, one of them was um, uh, Heaven Can't Wait, and, and the other is uh, Soothsayers the Second Advent. I haven't really been active with writing books in recent years because, as I said, my academic work has been so overwhelming. From 1998 to 2000, I finished my master's degree, and then it was into the doctoral work. You know, the dissertation, I did 498 pages, and so I'm just now getting back to some of this material as far as writing about it. But I do keep up with the work, and I've strongly endorsed, you know, what uh, the, uh, Guy Malone's ministry and the speakers this year. I was in a radio show recently, and I was saying that this is the best uh, conference that they've had yet here in Roswell. So I'm really, really thankful by the quality of speakers and what I've heard so far is really, really good. But UFO Cults in the New Millennium really dealt with some of my apologetics work. It dealt with what happened with the Heaven's Gate suicide cult. And there are about 10, 15, maybe more than that, really, really dangerous UFO groups operating today that, that are teaching mass destruction and all kinds of other things like that. So that's UFO Cults in the New Millennium. There's a little bit of rehash in both books, but that's some of my, my early work on UFOlogy. 
Now, um, what I put down, and we'll get to the topic of demons and falling angels a little bit later, but I put a statement of my findings early in my book, UFOs in the New Age, and I wrote this, and I hope you can all see the PowerPoints, but what I summarized after all these, going to all these UFO conferences, and I met many of the leaders back then of the UFO movement, the answer I will give you in these pages is that UFOs are real, that thousands of people around the world are receiving messages from them, and that these messages are forming the backbone of a new, powerful, new age religion of universalism and fellowship with entities many identify as aliens. Universalism means all paths lead to God. That's what most UFO believers really think, that, that it really doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. Everyone is welcome in this powerful new movement, they say, but their messages make apparent that not everyone is welcome, but only those who go along with a new age plan. Message after message I've had repeating this kind of thing. My background, uh, I, again, I'm an apologist. An apologist is someone who defends the faith. I was associated with the former Bible Answer Man, the late Dr. Walter Martin. He did my wedding. I was involved with his ministry, the news editor of the Christian Research Journal. But Walter Martin used to say this because he used to look at all false religions. And I really believe that all religions other than Christianity are false. I'm sorry, but I'm dogmatic on that point. I think there's some truth in other religions, you know, and I am tolerant, you know, I'm a tolerant fellow, you know, and I, I uh, but I think that, that, that God has revealed his, uh, himself through his son, as it says in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1. In, in former times God spoke through his prophets, today he talks to us through his son and the word of God. But Walter Martin we used to say that any movement is cultic or occultic if it tampers with the person, nature, or work of Jesus Christ, and I've added, and that's exactly what the overwhelming majority of the UFO movement does, tampers with the person of nature or work of Jesus Christ. It does almost, almost all the time. Now, the scriptures in Ephesians 2.2, Satan is referred to, and some of you know this, as a ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, Ephesians 2.2. And as I noted in my book, UFOs in the New Age, we know from various parts of the Bible that Satan has passed the power to manipulate matter at times, sometimes physically, and at other times by causing people to see strange things. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, Satan caused him to see intricate visions in his failed bid to alter Christ's mission. Perhaps this ability is one reason why Christ so firmly warned his disciples about religious deception, even the point of great signs from heaven in the era of his return. Make no mistake about it, I see part of the whole UFO movement as related to eschatology, the end times, things that will happen just before Jesus Christ comes back. And we have multiple scripture verses talking about massive deception coming over the whole planet. And I think the UFO movement is part of that. But again, I'm eclectic. I'm not that dogmatic about things. You know, I haven't really dealt with whether there could be life on other planets. I think there could be. You know, but I think that goes beyond what the Bible has to say. And I think we need to be open about things like that. Other scripture verses, and I'm going to be uh, sitting down for a little bit later. I'm dealing with a medical condition at this point, but I'll stand as long as I can. But other scriptural verses I want you to consider, and I'm going to read a few later, but in 2 Corinthians 11:14, Satan is described as an angel of light. So many times when these aliens come, or to abduct it for contactees and things like that, comes as an angel of light. And 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, it talks about the end times, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking to his young, young disciple Timothy, and he's saying, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearance in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And then he says this, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up from themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So I think a lot of what we have today is fables in the UFO movement. You know, I, you know, I, you know we're here in Roswell, the UFO capital of the world. There is just so much contradictory information over the Roswell 
crash, you know? I mean, I really don't know what to believe, to be honest with you. There are people in this room that are better read on it than I am, but people ask me that question all the time. I really don't know. There's supposedly three or four crash sites now. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible, the different uh, accounts that people have of the Roswell crash. In 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4, you know, the sister book of 2 Timothy, of course, this is really interesting, the way the Apostle Paul puts it, when he talks about the end times. And I'm sorry if I'm talking too fast, it's just that there's a lot of material I want to get through today. He says now, and this is really interesting the way he puts it forward. He says, now the Spirit expressly says, not hints around about, the Spirit expressly says, I mean, this is something that's definitely really, really important, that in the latter time, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. I'm here to, to, to posit today that a lot of what we have coming through the UFO movement is nothing more, nothing less than doctrines of demons. A lot of what we see out there is doctrines of demons. Now, there's more things that we can look at. There's a lot of verses I could give you today. Um, Galatians uh, 1.8 Paul talks about spirits coming along that would teach something different than the simplicity of the gospel. And he says, even if an angel preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. So ufology can be very akin in many ways to angelology as well. There's a fascinating with angels today. And you'll see that people like Shirley MacLaine and many other New Agers, they're not only into UFOs, but they're into angels as well. And if you read some of their literature, there's a firm link between the two. You know, so um, uh, another passage I could refer to, uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to get into this all the way, but Acts chapter 20, verse 29, that's when Paul went to Miletus, you know, is along the coast in uh, Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, and he talked about, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, and they will not spare the flock. So Paul was talking about deception coming after the first century church. There was a lot there during the first century church as well, but there was a great falling away in the first century also. Uh, the, the Montanus movement, a lot of other things that happened, and the deception has always been there with the genuine. And a lot of people look at the deception. I was witnessing to a Muslim student the other day at Cal State East Bay. I like working for a, for a state university because of the fact that we can, you know, uh, the privately, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I'm the, I'm the advisor on campus for Campus Crusade for Christ. So there's a lot I can do there, you know, with talking to people privately about the Lord. And I said, look, the most important thing I could tell you is that Jesus is the only way. Je Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And she goes, well, but I have problems with Christianity. And I said to her, I have problems with it as well. You know, because of look at how many warped versions of Christianity we have out there. There's all kinds of people that'll, that'll give you the gospel plus, that have you go to confession, all kinds of other things that aren't even mentioned or even hinted at in the word of God. And so, you know, the secret is believing in Jesus Christ and him alone. You know, as Michael said just before, you know, the last speaker, Mike Heiser, talking about the atonement, it is really, really important. I mean, this is God's way of salvation to the planet today. So, so uh, anyway, so uh, let, let's go on a little bit further. Uh, modern society, as I mentioned, is overwhelmed with tales of angels, and even entire religions started by angels. One of the religions started by an angel was Mormonism, supposedly. The angel Moroni came to Joseph Smith, you know, and gave gave the golden plates. They were, you know, uh, and, and the Book of Mormon came as a result of that. Um, all these things that add on to the gospel, that add even all kinds of different things, another twist onto the simplicity of the gospel, you know, they interfere with the simplicity of the gospel. In my, in my books, I talk about all these things that have been added onto the gospel and ufology in general as cosmic tail chasing. Uh, in following the UFO movement for many years, there's lots of people that have, and you can just see this in Roswell, that have devoted their entire lives to UFOs. Now think of this, and let me grab a seat for a minute. Since 1947, since Kenneth Arnold spotted these seven discs spot, uh, skipping above him in the sky near Mount Rainier, Washington, how much more do we know about UFOs than we did back then? There is still no major consensus out there. I mean, as Michael was showing, there's all these different strains of thought. There's still no major absolute consensus of what they are or what they are not. 
And so a lot of people have d devoted their entire lives. I mean, down the street, we've got the UFO Museum. We've got all kinds of organizations. And people, this is their hobby and even their professions, just to be following this stuff all the time. So I call a lot of the UFO enigma cosmic tail chasing, because you can never really get to the bottom of it. And that's really the nature of this type of deception. There's no one, I mean, probably in this room, there must, there's all kinds of different attitudes and different opinions over what they are. One of the things that I find really interesting, and I don't want to be a skeptic, you know, I'm kind of a skeptic about a lot of things. My background, I used to be a reporter in the Philadelphia region, a daily newspaper reporter. I've got a degree in journalism, master's degree in journalism, and a doctorate in mass media communications. But one of, one of the things is that, um, you know, um, I'm real skeptical about, about lots of things, you know, and so, but, you know, it's interesting with modern technology today. Now, um, and I'm just going to throw this out, not, and this is like un, unprepared, it's not part of my, you know, slides or anything like that, but whenever there's a tornado today, we almost always get it on video. You know, all, and they're really clear. You know, when I was a kid, I'm 54 years old right now, the photography wasn't that good. I mean, you could see some pictures of tornadoes, but when now, now when a tornado comes down, we see it on the national news all the time. Why don't we see more and more pictures, crystal clear pictures of UFOs today? We really don't see very many, you know, and again, I think that's part of the nature of the deception. I think that UFOs can be understood in many ways as a spiritual phenomena. As an article I once wrote in this topic, the, the editor put in, UFOs in the realm of shadows. It's kind of like part of the realm of shadows and many things we look at. And I think it's part of the spiritual realm, uh, realm by and large. Although, again, you know, I'm not saying that the extraterrestrial hypothesis, there could not be some truth to that. Again, as I said before, I'm a, a little bit eclectic, like, as Mike Heiser is as well. But Paul noted in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 5, he says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted by the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. So Paul was concerned about a different Jesus or a different gospel. And in UFO literature, and again, I, uh, what I did is I went around mapping what the contactees were saying. And I was really shocked in the early 90s to find out that really a lot of the contactees talk a lot about Jesus. They really do. I mean, there's really all kinds of talk about Jesus in contactee li literature. But I don't know of a single contactee that says that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. They always redefine who Jesus is as a great spiritual leader, someone who's on par with Buddha or Muhammad. Some religious cults, such as the Raelian movement, says that Jesus and, and Lucifer are brothers and that this is what they found out. And so you'll never find anyone that I've ever seen in ufology declaring that the contactees came to, him, came to him and revealed that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that he's the atonement and that he's, he's the way, the truth, and the life, as it says in John 14, 6. Okay, now how does this relate to demon, demonology or demons? Um, I postulate that UFO and abduction experience is not new, it has just become more intensified since the modern era of ufology began in 1947 when Kenneth Arnold spotted silver disks uh, skipping above him in the sky near Mount Rainier, Washington. And moreover, some of the most virulent, virulent anti-Christian UFO writers have noted the same, even suggesting that they are related to the realm of the spiritual, even using the terms demons and not necessarily extraterrestrial in origin. One of the most prolific UFO writers has been, and I've read a lot of his work, Whitley Strieber. I mean, very, um, how can I put it? I'm very critical of Whitley Strieber. I just read his book, 2012. I don't think it's a very good book. It's not written very well. But, but if you look through that book, he talks about this time in 2012 when the, when the, the gates are going to open, what, December 21st or something like that. And uh, anyway, so, but it's all filled with all kinds of ideas about spirituality and UFOs and parallel universes. And this is what Whitley Strieber says in his book, Transformation, which was the sequel to Communion. 
But he says this, the visitor experience is old. 200 years ago, a farmer might have come in from his plowing and said, I saw fairies dancing in the glen. A thousand years ago, he might have seen angels flying. 2,000 years ago, it would have been Dionysus leaping in the fields. 4,000 years ago, he might have seen the goddess Earth herself walking those old hills, her starry robe sparkling with the true pure light of magic. Um, we, we um, I don't know, there's a typo there. Anyway, it's, it goes on to say, we hide in beliefs they're gods, the gentry, dwarves, elves, they're demons or angels, aliens, the unconscious, the oversoul, hallucinations, mass hysteria, lies, you name it. So he kind of talks about how they could be related to the realm of demons as well, but the sad thing about his work is he felt this was good. Now, an interesting book that came out that a lot of people quote, you know, uh, is written by, it's called The, Alien, uh, the Fellowship by Brad Steiger. And what he did is he did something like I did, except he did it much more in depth, and he comes at it from a different, much different perspective than I do. He's not a believer at all, and in fact, he practices the occult and does all kinds of things like that. But he wrote the book called The Fellowship, in which he was gathering messages, excuse me, from the contactees from all over the world, and, and he said that The Fellowship is the Space Brothers Apocrypha. And his idea was we have the Bible and we have other holy writings, and, but we don't, no one is codifying the work of the contactees into one book until his book came along, The Fellowship. And he put a succinct statement into what he felt the contactees were saying to us today. And this is what he said, and this is quoted in his, it's in his book, but it's on page 15 in my book, UFOs in the Na New Age. But if, if you had to make one paragraph about what the contactees believe, is this. Contactees have been told that the space beings hope to guide Earth to a period of great unification when all races will shun discriminatory separations and all of humankind will recognize its responsibility to every other life form existing on the planet. The space beings also seem to bring about a single solidified government which will conduct itself in spiritual principles and permit all of its citizens to grow constructively in love. That's really interesting, a single solidified government, one world, and you see we're moving closer and closer to this. This is part of a, like a, like part of a whole agenda that I think can be e the most easily understood, although I'm not real dogmatic on the topic, but I think if we look into the, what it talks about with eschatology, the things of the end, Bible prophecy, the Bible talks about in the end times a one world government, a one world religion. And ufology is pushing us towards that because it's linked with the new age and it's linked with all kinds of other things that we see happening today. Now, uh, some of this is from my book, UFOs in the New Age, but we have all kinds of traditions that go back into ancient time when we deal with other religious belief systems. And, um, and I'll just read some of the things from here. But the forces of evil and the gods of the euphonauts were there with the formation of the false religion of Shinto in Japan. I'm sorry if I'm offending some people today, but I believe that Christianity is the only true religion. I think the other religions, there's some truth in some of them, some of the things, but I think the roots of most of the false religions is demonic and false. But uh, the false religion of Shinto, an ancient religion that fuses ancestor worship with mysticism. The early source books that reinforced, reinforced the mythology behind the religion are Kojiki, which is a rec record of ancient things, AD 712, and Nihoji or Nik Nihosaki, sorry if I'm mispronouncing certain things, records of Japan, AD 720. These books emphasize the divine descent of the imperial house, but wrote religious historian Robert S. Elwood, Jr. They also exemplify the main theses of Shinto myth in general, the descent of the sky gods to marry earth goddesses. So you can see there's a parallel between some other religious systems. And today in Japan, ufology is big business. This is a worldwide movement, folks. It's not, even though Roswell in many ways is a UFO capital of the world, I mean, you go anywhere in the world, it doesn't matter if it's third world or South America, Australia, Africa, you know, in some parts of the world it's bigger than it is even the United States, but in Japan it's really, really big business. The Japanese public eagerly follows many of the recent developments of ufology, and some ufologists believe the Shinto tradition 
conditions are part of the reasons for its popularity. And I would agree with that. And uh, in South America, I mean, it's really, really huge, the UFO business. Uh, let me, oop, I better, there we go. Uh, I think I need to go back one. I think I just missed one. Okay. Likewise, in the ancient Bhagavad Gita, that's one of the primary texts of Hinduism, are references to beings from other realms coming to earth. A.A. Uh, a. A. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Buddha, who gained a great number of followers in the 60s as a founder of the Hindu-based Hare Krishna movement, even released a highly read translation that inserted the word planets, meaning alien planets to describe other realms as origin travel points of the gods. While well, some would no doubt argue that Prabhupada Buddha's choice of the word planet in the text, early Hindu literature that predates Christianity by a millennium contains various references to flying celestial and aerial cars and even flying discs. Okay, wrong way here. Okay, other ancient religious traditions contain references to the gods coming to earth to mingle with humankind. Brad Steiger tells us that the, that the legends of the Eskimos tell of their ancestors being flown about by, quote, godlike beings with metallic wings. Steiger is among a growing number of New Ages who are being attracted to Native American, South American shamanistic religions, and he, along with many others, is quite willing to link them with aliens. Steiger claims that the Bible of the Quinche's tribe in Guatemala talks about visitors coming from the skies, bringing with them unusual knowledge. Now, a lot of people today in ufology, and I'm looking at my time here, um, uh, are fascinated with South America. When Brad and St Sherry Steiger returned from their September 1990 tour of the ancient cities in Peru, they claimed they found new evidence that the Inca Indians were really Incas, I-N-K-A-S, visitors from the stars who are returning to Earth today to help usher in a new age of shamanism. And so they go on talking about some of the ancient ruins down there, the Nazca Lines, the Pyramid of the Sun of Pachachuma, the Sun Temple in Cusco, and the mountain city of Machu Picchu. They claim that these are all built by alien civilizations. And of course, if you look at the occult literature that often comes as ufology, a lot of people add the pyramids and all kinds of other things in, into this, is, into this uh, equation. I don't take a lot of that seriously at all because a lot of these ideas have been discredited. You know, Mike and others will talk about ancient astronaut theories. You know, a lot of the ideas of, of Sitchin, you know, as Michael knows, and, and Von Donneken have been discredited. I'm always amazed how so many people looking at the Nazca line say this could have been an ancient airstrip. When I read Chariots of the Gods by Von Donneken when I was a teenager, it hit me like a revelation. I thought it was really, really true. But the Nazca lines, you kind of know what those are. They're in, they're in Peru, a series of lines. They're only like three foot, feet wide. You know, they're only really, really short. You know, so they really couldn't be landing strips or UFOs. And so, so as I pointed out in my book, I dealt with some of the ancient astronaut theorists. You know, a lot of their ideas have been really discredited when you really begin to look into what exactly they're saying. You know, like uh, Sitchin, uh, it, was, it wasn't Sitchin, Von Donneken was saying that the Ark of the Tabernacle was really like a radio transmitter. I mean, ideas like that are just nothing more than sheer speculation, trying to make the Bible say something of what they want it to say. And I think Sitchin goes a lot further along those lines. But let's go on further with, um, um, and, and here's kind of what I believe. It isn't kind of what I believe, but it is what I believe. Uh, ancient lies from the ruler of the king of the air. I believe that Satan, you know, and again, I don't say this lightly. I'm not one that says there's a demon behind every bush, you know, and I'm not really a fundamentalist. I'm, I'm an evangelical. I'm a scholar. You know, I spent some time. I was a pastor of a church. I went to Dallas Seminary for a while. So I don't look at spiritual things in a real simplistic way. But I think that, you know, uh, you know I believe that Satan has been preparing humankind for confusion throughout history. And as we get even closer to the time of Christ's return, Many of the Saint, Satan's centuries-old occult lies are coalescing, making it easier for people to accept false religious ideas, even within the Christian church. 
In the same way, he's induced people through pagan religions to build triangular pyramids and divergent sites throughout the ancient world, such as in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula and in Egypt to make humankind today believe there's something significant in pyramids. And you look in some of the works of people like Whitley Strieber and others like that, they talk about the Trinity a lot. But they don't really talk about the Trinity as being the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They talk about this, the Trinity being the God force, uh, aliens the second part, humankind being the third part. So there's a lot of confusion out there in ufology over the Trinity and pyramids and, and things like that. And so there's many Trinity-like counterfeits that we see going on today. Um, my thesis statement, I've already implied this before, and again, I, I don't want to offend anyone with what I say, but, you know, I've studied religions, and Jesus Christ is very real to me. You know, I, I came in as a teenager, you know, even though my dad is a Methodist minister, told me everything I needed to do. We had Bible reading in my house, but I rebelled. I was into drugs, a child of the 60s, all kinds of things. And then I, call, I asked Jesus to come into my life. I repented of my sins, and so he became real to me. It was interesting how Michael was talking about how 30, more than, what, 30% or something of people today don't believe the Holy Spirit is real. Well, the Holy Spirit is real to me. When I got born again, he came to my life and changed me right away. You know, I, I, you know, I stopped the drinking. I stopped the drugs. My life was turned upside down. And I found that when people would curse and use the name of Jesus Christ, it's like people punching me in the face. You know, it's like the Holy Spirit came into my life. And so the more I study this, the more I, 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 I see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And furthermore, Christianity stands alone among all the world's religions. It is not one religion among many that is valid. It claims to be the only valid way to God. And that truth is precisely the main point. The gospel, according to the extraterrestrial beings, will deny every time. And that's what I charted, you know, what, what is, is there a gospel of the ETs, you know, going to conferences everywhere, to, uh, transcribing contactees message, and they'll deny this every time. Do you, does anyone know any contactees that come forward and say that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and the Bible is God's word? No. They always, they mix a little bit of the Bible in, and they talk about Jesus, but they always warp his person, nature, or work. The euphonauts trifle with Western man, and this is something that has taken place. I see I've got about 20 more minutes. How am I? Oh, good. I'm doing pretty well on my slides. So anyway, this is, this is fun being with you here today. Well, there is reason to doubt many ancient myths from the Far Eastern Indian cultures and alleged visitations from space. The factual chroniclers of other traditions, including those from the Western world, have also given us ample evidence that someone or something has been toying with humanity for a long time through strange sighting happenings in the sky. As I pointed out in my book, UFOs of the New Age, and I repeat it in my further writings, one of the deceptions about ufology is it's trying to get us to look at the sky instead of the God who made the sky. You know, that's one of the problems with it. All, people are always chasing their tails, always looking for here and there. Jesus said, as a wicked generation, a followeth after a sign. And that's a lot of what this movement is all about. Kenneth Arnold wasn't even the first person to coin the term flying saucer. Or Jacques Vallée, I think a terrific researcher in many ways. Uh, um, uh, John Martin, a farmer from Texas, saw a flying disc cruising high in the sky at enormous speed on January 24th, 1878, and he used the term saucer to describe it. But in past centuries, and this is the difference between today and the past centuries, these have, uh, these, these have taken on many other forms. It is interesting, as I point out in my book, uh, to find that reports were made in practically the same terms as the modern ones concerning strange vehicles flying across the sky long before the advent of Christ. And this is, of course, Valet's words. The Valet's book, uh, Anatomy of Phenomena, he notes that he has on file reports of more than 300 UFO sightings prior to the 20th century. Uh, and here's some of them. And again, this will all wrap up into demonology in just a few minutes. In the annals of Thutmose Th 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 III of Egypt, who reigned about 1480 to 1450 BC, it is recorded that a circle of fire appeared in the sky, and after a time, these things became more numerous in the sky than ever. The army of the Pharaoh looked on with him in their midst when the first circles rose higher in the sky. 
Valet notes, quoting ancient books, that in 218 BC, there is a UFO wave in the Roman Empire. Strange men in white clothing appeared in various places. A shield flew through the sky. Two moons appeared at night. Ghost ships appeared in the sky. And in other places, luminous lamps appeared in the heavens. Other Roman writers, such as Pliny, Seneca, Julius Obsquinkinus, and Jonas Lydus, also wrote of, quote, flying columns in the flying shields that allegedly zoom through the empire. So this phenomena is not new. It goes back with us a long time. In Scotland, AD, uh, AD 60, there's a lot of other listings, and I'm just going get to th get through this uh, uh, more quickly. A ship was often seen speeding across the sky, and Valet lists other sightings. In 9, 919, uh, 919 in Hungary, spherical objects shining like stars were reported. And then in, in Japan in 1015, two objects were seen giving birth to smaller luminous spheres. Cairo in August 1027, numerous noisy objects were reported. And a large silvery disk is said to have come close to the ground in Japan in August 12, 1133. So this is really a worldwide deception that has been with us for such a long time. And as I said, no one today really knows much more about them than we did in 1947. Similar reports went through the Middle Ages of the 20th century. John Weldon and Zola Levitt, uh, Christian writers, uh, talk about, and of course other people documented this, that in 1492, Christopher Columbus, standing on the deck of his wooden ship, reported lights moving up and down in the distant sky. In fact, prior to 1947, a whole body of occult literature discusses creatures from other dimensions contacting humankind. But the difference between earlier times and today is that they were not usually seen as aliens from other planets, but were associated with religious beliefs and were treated as manifestation of supernatural forces. It's only in our era today that we think they, they are, they're not demons or are not related to spiritual things. It's almost, and, and they're little people in most cases, right? If you go back to the Middle Ages, they had these legends of dwarfs and fairies. They were little people as well. It's just that today they're in their one-piece jumpsuits claiming to come out of flying saucers. But in earlier generations, people linked them firmly with the occult and the world of the demons. And I'll, I'll lay this out even further. Coming into the 20th century, they were known by a variety of names, including elves, fairies, goblins, gnomes, we folk, and many other titles depending on the culture. Legends grew up about them. In medieval folklore, they were seen as coming from a mythical land above the clouds known as Magonia, or the land of the fairy. Today, we think they come from different planets. We think they come from, or some people think they come from different dimensions. We're not really sure. In fact, some argue that these fairies, long associated with the occult, are in reality demons posing as aliens today in an attempt to trick humankind. According to occult literature, fairies and elves have a long history of being tricksters. To understand how prominent fairies figures into folklore, one has to read no further than Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream to find Puck. He was a little fairy, a mischievous fairy trying to manipulate circumstances in people's lives. Historically, fairies have also been linked to building mounds in the fields and dancing in crop fields and making circles. Some have suggested that the crop circles could really be fairy rings. But one thing is certain, fairies, elves, gnomes, goblins, sifts, and other entities have always been, until the UFO enigma today, been associated with evil satanic forces and not with the God of the Bible. Some varieties of these otherworldly beings have been directly accused of being demons. The dark side of these visitors, if you've read some UFO literature, you'll know there's a very dark side to a lot of them. Some of Whitley Strieber's, and Whitley Strieber has written some really dangerous books. You know, Communion was very dangerous as far as the spiritual ideas he puts forward. But some of Whitley Strieber's experience with the visitors, uh, for example, are sexual. He admits having been sexually attracted and aroused by one of the visitors and to being in love with them. And in light of the fact that many contactees talked about, contactees talked about being afflicted by the visitors with strange sexual rituals and operations, he talks frankly about the possibility they may be incubi or succubi, demonic creatures who allegedly rape humans. And he thinks this is good. 
and he goes through mental problems, has a nervous breakdown, all kinds of other things, and he says that it's somehow, somehow good. Uh, it's an illogical conclusion. Instead of accepting the traditional view of the Incubi and Succubi as evil demons bent on destroying humanity, Strieber again laps into illogical reasoning and writes that he sees them as saviors and hints that their lives may be linked to our own. He writes that they may be trying to save us from ourselves because without humans, their lives may be less exciting. Maybe there really is another species, and I'm quoting him directly here, living upon this earth, the fairies, the gnomes, the sifts, the vampires, goblins, who attach to reality along a different line than we do, but who know how to love us. He calls them the visitors, but he links them to flying saucers. He links them to discs in the sky. And, uh, and so he links it all together. According to the Encyclopedia of Witchcraft and Demonology, which is written by Russell H. Robbins, an incubus is an angel who fell because of lust for women. Essentially, the incubus is a lewd demon or goblin which seeks sexual intercourse with women. It is also termed follet in French, alp in German, dunde in Spanish, and folletto in Italian. The corresponding devil who appears to men is a succubus. So it's interesting. In every culture, you have this phenomena coming around. And if you read contactee literature, all kinds of sexual experiments go along with, with, with uh, contactees. Uh, missing fetuses, I'm not here to address anything like that or anything of that nature. A lot of people have written about this, this topic. But it really seems that there's a lot of similarities towards sexual experiments that have been recorded all the way back into the Middle Ages and even before. Before then, um, if, if, if you're reading historic documents about this phenomena. So my conclusion to a lot of this is that, as I said this before, that Satan has been pre preparing humankind for confusion throughout history. And as we get even closer to the time of Christ's return, many of Satan's centuries-old occult lies are coalescing, making it easier for people to accept false religious ideas even within the Christian church. So, and I'll say this again, and I kind of sound like maybe a little preacher up here today, but I believe this, you know, I, you know, I, the, Jesus Christ saved me from my sins, and he's guided my life, and, and, and anyone that's been a committed Christian for a long time know very much that this is true. You know, we do have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you know. I'm not saying I've ever heard to God in an audible voice, but the still small voice of the Holy Spirit does come to me, and when I'm troubled, you know, he comforts me, and, and I always know what to do next in my life, whether, you know, what I should do next, you know. I can all also have the freedom to be disobedient, which I've been from time to time, you know, so the Holy Spirit does guide us. But Christianity, you know, does stand alone among all the world's religions. It is not re one religion among many that is valid. It claims to be the only way to God. And th that truth is precisely the main point the gospel, according to extraterrestrial beings, will deny every time. And again, if anyone has any information, about anyone, any contactees ever saying that Jesus Christ is a way, that, you know, giving the biblical truth, actually, you know, I would be shocked because I've been studying this stuff since really the 1970s, you know, and I've never seen a single contactee message that affirms that Jesus Christ is the only way. And, and so, so this is the nature of the deception. And so as I conclude this, this is why I think that there is a definite parallel between demonology and the contactees and the UFO movement in general. You know, I'm not here to condemn all of it. You know, uh, you know again, I'm pretty open-minded with a lot of what I believe. I have good relations, I think, with a lot of the people that are in the UFO movement. I just tell them, brother, I think you're wrong about this. You know, <laughs> Brad Steiger, I got to know as um, I, I gave an acknowledgement in one of my books because he sat down with me and talked to me about his belief system. And, um, you know, a lot of the other UFO people that, that, not, not, you know, that uh, I've really discussed with. But there have been a lot of people, Jacques Vallée and John Keel is another one, that have related ufology to demonology. When I first started researching UFOs, I went to a conference in Washington, D.C., and one of the speakers was John Keel. 
and he wrote the famous book. It's, it's a classic in UFO literature called UFOs Operation Trojan Horse. And I introduced myself to him. I was a reporter for a newspaper at the time, and I said, I have a contract to write a book on UFOs, and I was real happy to meet him. I was very impressed with his work. A lot of his work talks about demonology, and he was talking about a lot of the UFO, you know, how there's links between names, between demons and current contactees and all kinds of things like that. And he said, you're, UFO, you're researching UFOs, and John Keel was not a believer. You know, and he said to me, well, your UFO, you're, you're researching this, be extremely careful. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, are you finding poltergeist activity in your house? Are the lights coming on for no reason? Is the phone ringing for no reason? Is the tele television coming on and off for no reason? Are there shadows? Are there ghosts in your house? And I said, no. You know, and he said, that's, that's unusual, because most people that get into this stuff really begin researching it. They're haunted by this type of thing. And so he very much saw ufology along with demonology and even the concept of ghosts and angels and things like that. But I didn't run into any of that, because I think there's a biblical truth there, and I hope this doesn't sound pompous or anything like that. But the Bible says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so I'm not really encouraging people to research UFOs. And I always warn people against it. You know, I think it's a calling that God gave me. I research general apologetics, the realm of darkness I look at, you know, a lot. You know, I've written a lot of articles in cults, you know, and that's one reason my website, cultlink.com, I've written a lot of articles in cults, you know, and, and, and movements like that. I've studied, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, all the traditional cults, as well as a lot of the brand new cults. But I think that if we're committed to the Lord, he will protect us, you know, from, from the wiles of Satan. And he's used me in many ways to expose some of the goings on of darkness, I think, that is very much filled in with the UFO movement. And I would agree with the two speakers we've had today and the other speakers that are at this conference. I'm really impressed with this year's lineup. It's really, really terrific, you know. But, you know, we really need to sensitize the church, you know. Um, uh, you know, we, there, there are polls out there, and Mike shared some of them with us, but now more than half of all of Americans believe that UFOs are real and they, they come from another planet. You know, I talk about some of the polls in my writings as well. And so this is a ministry. This is a mission field. And I'm glad there's a lot of Christians in this room, particularly this weekend here in Roswell, that we can, you know, that we're going to go to the parade tomorrow and all kinds of other things that went going on. But let your light shine, the light of Christ, so that all may know. And th this is a deception. The Apostle Paul was talking about, you know, bringing captive all the, all the deceptive things. You know, uh, Paul, uh, like Peter talked about, well, Jude talks about, contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. And I think the Lord can use us to show the difference between the true gospel and the false gospel of the euphonauts. Let's have a word of prayer, and I can open it up. I'm just on time here. Perfect, you know. Let's have a word of prayer, you know, and if you're not a Christian, you know, you don't have to go along with this. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we're having today in Roswell studying some of the dark things. And we don't study darkness for any particular reason other than, than we want to, uh, to show the light of you and what you've done in the cross 2,000 years ago. Lord, we ask that you remove the eyes, the, the, the deception from the eyes of a lot of people that are following the UFO movement today. Lord, we know that a lot of it is a spiritual phenomena. And Lord, we just ask that you bring people out of ufology into the realm of the light. Now, one other thing I'll mention, um, Anyway, in Jesus' name we pray. One other thing I wanted to mention is uh, one of the speakers I'm looking forward to tomorrow morning is Joe Jordan. And I've done some articles about this, and I'm not going to steal his thunder. But it's really interesting when someone is being abducted, how many cases, and I've written some articles about this myself, if people call out in the name of Jesus, the abduction experience stops. Isn't that amazing? The name above all names, Jesus Christ. I don't know how many people I've talked to that, that they were in the realms of an abduction experience and they called out the name of Jesus and suddenly the experience stops. But Joe will tell you more about that, I'm sure. And, some, and he's, he's codified a lot of this in some of his research that he's done in Florida. And so it's really interesting how powerful the name of Jesus is. There's not a name on this earth that's more powerful than the name of Jesus. And that's the thing that we should emphasize, I think, with our interactions with everyone, that Jesus is God in human flesh, you know, the second person, the Trinity. And that's the name that's above all names, you know, and, and, and without him, we're nothing. 
Okay. Well, thanks for having me today. I really enjoyed my time with you.